Well, thank you very much for that very thought-provoking, um, I suppose, springboard for a discussion. Now, I see you kind of throughout that actually I wasn't going to ask the first question, and that actually I was just going to fling it open to the audience. Um, so, off we go. I think it's so possible that historians could live with this picture, but it will leave them with some questions. And it's important, I think, to see if there are answers to the questions that will leave them. I'm not going to give them a long list of the questions. I'm just going to assess one or two. Um, first of all, I think it will leave them necessarily with the question of um, if, if culture works in assigning value, if that's, I mean, how value is, that's where it is and how it operates. I, I think it will leave them with the question how whimsically it works. I mean, how much play there is in its working or how tight the structure its working is, whether this is actually... I mean, the exciting idea in structuralism heard for the first time is it shows you exactly how things are shaped. And the distressing sort of arrière-pensée is that maybe it won't show you at all exactly how things are shaped. It'll show you in a necessarily very inexact way what a shaping process is like. And that will suggest there's a great deal of cognitive free play within it. So it's important how much free play there is for the way cognition operates in this structure. But the other question, which I think a historian is almost bound to, to want to press, is this, all this stuff must have happened. Historians have a sort of tacit metaphysic, whether they acknowledge it or not. All of this stuff must have happened in time. This must have come about somehow. And they, I think they would want to press the question, is there anything you can say within having seen the the human predicament this way, and it's a very powerful way to see the human predicament, is there anything you can say on the basis of having seen it this way which casts any light at all about how this way comes into existence and acquires this shape? Uh, I would have to have a time machine for the latter, but I... I uh, the question of uh, how much play there is uh, in the structure is is not uh, is, uh, nothing has been motivated by what I said in terms of how um, how much play or how much contingency uh, is involved in the formation of the of the cultural order and its changes. Uh, on, uh, I mean, I have written about that in other in other contexts. And, um, and my position is, uh, as, as you probably know, that, I, uh, that, that there, are, uh, there is, an, uh, there is an, an, an interesting play between contingency and, and structure, always. Uh, and in fact, I, when I talked about the Egyptian spring, which I finally have decided must be like the Cambridge spring. <laughs> <laughs> Namely, then when spring comes, winter can't be far behind. <laughs> uh, um, that, uh, that, uh, that anthropology, uh, that struck, that anthrop that it, it is like other parts of anthropology, namely the way that, uh, that uh, uh, structures deal with contingencies. With this proviso that uh, what is an event that is a contingency is itself a function of a structure. Uh, that is, what its significance is going to be is itself a, a function of the structure. Uh, you know, and I, in other cases, I use, for example, uh, uh, the uh, when Captain Cook came to Hawaii, the the women came out and ate. Uh, and ate um, in the company of the sailors uh, and violating a, a Hawaiian taboo on uh, the men and women eating together. Uh, and now as a viol as it became a violation of taboo and therefore of extraordinary importance in subsequent events. In another society, it would be a date for lunch. 
<laughs> so what it, what the significance of the of the happening is is itself a, a function of the order in which it's happening. Uh, also, then, however, it, the order itself does not predict uh, the event. Uh, uh, the event that is sui generis from the point of view of the order, and, and that being the case, uh, it changes, uh, it, it can and would change under various contingent conditions. There are other ways that uh, the structure is in play, which I won't go into, but I have no, there's nothing I said today that precludes the notion of uh, a liability of the system. Um, oh, what was the second one again? I couldn't... How do these things come about? How do these things come about? Uh, <coughs> uh, one one um, study of Levi-Strauss's uh, <coughs> actually spoke of it as a contractual relationship. Uh, it was the Manda and Hidatsa relationship on the Great Plains, uh, w where uh, the Manda uh, moved into uh, Hidatsa territory. Oh, I think it was that way, and not the other way around. Don't don't hold me on it for the moment. Uh, and and uh, uh, and they they decided uh, as a kind of mutual decision that they should stay apart but not too far <laughs> and that they should be different but not too different uh, and uh, and that it was by as he said it was by the creation of these differences that they learned to live with each other uh, the other examples from Melanesia imply a kind of um, working out of a of a differentiation or specialization of uh, of production uh, and even of environmental uh, articulations uh, that are that are yes over time but that are simply contingent on each other and in this respect what I said today it goes with what I said yesterday namely whatever however we're going to figure this out it's going to be a question of the interdependence of societies and not a question of the sui generis development of societies. That we, that we are always dealing with people who are in relation to each other, uh, which as I, I said yesterday, uh, is interesting because, and, and in some ways uh, implies a great scandal in anthropological theory in the sense that all our theories suppose uh, the independence and autonomy of the system. All of them, structural functionalism, evolutionism, uh, Marxism, you name it, they all suppose uh, that societies develop in a sui generis fashion. Uh, and, there, and, and this is, and this is, the, is a uh, discipline that was born, say, in, in the late uh, 19th century where already for, uh, there's, a, there's no, practically nobody in the world who lives like that. There is a, some group in, of Eskimo in, in uh, Greenland who, are, who supposed they were all alone. Right? They thought they were all alone. Uh, but it's the only case I, uh, I've ever heard of. <laughs> uh, even those who are on isolated islands don't think they are really all alone. Uh, there, there are islands in the sky. There are other islands somewhere else. Uh, so, and and they predicate their existence on each other. Uh, so, it's got, it, I'm sure it was a temporal process, uh, but uh, I don't have. You know, we have very few long uh, studies of longevity of, of that sort. Um, I'll, I'll speak more to the bit on difference in, in, in your second paper and, and the, two, the two last points of the three. I mean, I think 
The reason why anthropologists for such a long time have had so much trouble explaining societies that are segmentary or that are hierarchical, that have difference as the basis of, of um, relations, um, is that we are very much, um, we, we live in a condition of extreme obliteration of difference, which is what you were saying, of course, um, where difference is um, inimical to relations rather than conducive to them, where difference is, um, s markers of difference are completely offensive to us, any markers of uh, difference in sex, um, gender, um, race, whatever, is, um, is offensive and also relations across difference are very offensive. Um, so it's very difficult for us to perceive places where difference is a, is a very high value and difference is what is constitutive of the social. So, but there's something um, here that's quite interesting, I think, and I wonder, it's more of a comment for you to respond to, um, that the very high value that we've replaced this value of difference with is choice which in itself implies difference. In order to make a choice, you have to have more than one thing to choose from. And of course, choice, well, what it means is if we've obliterated difference in social relations, and we can only relate through sameness or shared substance or shared essence, um, there seems to be a lot of value placed on the difference of things, or what we call things, um, as the basis for functioning, I suppose, in the world. Um, and that may have something to do with our particular style of thinking about economics. I'm sorry, it's not a question. <laughs> well, I, uh, I think it's correct, uh, uh, largely correct. Any other the, the uh, I think it's striking that um, we have this identity of sameness and equality. I mean, it, it's hard to suppose that people who are different are equal. In our in our notions, uh, and uh, and that's uh, obviously a fundamental problem of our present politics. Uh, so, and to that extent, I you know I agree with you, or or for that reason, I agree with you. Um, other question, but following John. Second question, you have shown how it came about in, in at least one context, which is in historical metaphors and mythical realities, what happens with nails and, 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 and women who exchange it. But, but there, the relationship between value and scarcity is elaborated in, in seems to me to be elaborated in, in, in another distinction that Polanyi made between exchange, redistribution, and reciprocity. Um, so I, my question is, if you were to reconsider your, uh, your flipping of the relationship that value determines, uh, value shapes scarcity, not the other way around, it seems to me that the economist's way, the economist's definition of value, the value that is determined by scarcity, has only exchange, or the ideology, ideology of all we are doing is exchange as a kind of value, whereas the value you're talking about, that which shapes scarcity, has at least uh, a combination of reciprocity exchange and redistribution. Yeah, but, often, but often it has nothing to do with uh, with exchange. I mean, it's appropriated. Uh, it's, it could be appropriated by uh, by raid, by trade, or uh, all kinds of ways. Yeah, yeah, it isn't, and it doesn't necessarily. Certainly, it doesn't. These monies do not establish uh, their value by exchange because they're often not uh, they're not appropriated in any form of trade uh, so I mean, it could be a spirit quest it could be all kinds of things. Uh, so so I I, I uh, I'm not I'm not a fan of the notion of um, value having arisen by exchange, reciprocity, or, or of any other sort. So, if, if that is the case, what, what would a uh, reconstruction of Western economy, not of economists' version of Western economy, but let's say national bounded economy, 
how would you reconstruct it, how would you analyze it using the same tools that you've done to analyze all these various examples? Well, I tried to show you. I mean, the point is, you would, you would understand it by, uh, as in, for example, um, one of the examples I liked here, which I didn't uh, just talk about, was, uh, was the American pattern, diurnal, diurnal pattern of eating, mm -hmm. which uh, a friend of mine uh, pointed out to me, which is, I mean, it's something, it's so common, you don't think it's, uh, it's interesting, but in fact, it's weird. And that is uh, that we eat the same thing for breakfast all the time. <laughs> Always the same thing, and from a very restricted range of foods, uh, and usually in a catch-as-catch-can manner in your house. I mean, if you're up first, you have the coffee first or whatever, and uh, you, you don't necessarily have it with other people. Uh, and, uh, and then as you go through the day, the foods that you eat become more diversified. Uh, and the social relations which you uh, uh, are engaged in in eating become more valuable. So in the middle of the day, if it's a work week, you're having a range of food from like sandwiches, salads, and so on, uh, which are, we, we call lunch, which is relatively uh, more varied than breakfast, uh, but and it's taken in the in the uh, company of acquaintances or co-workers of people uh, that you're associated with outside the family. But the best meal of the day, the honorable meal, is dinner. And dinner is the most diversified meal of the day. So much so that, uh, and this is a part of the unconscious habitus of these values, that when you that if you're shopping for dinner, you always think of what you had last night for dinner because you can't duplicate what you had last night for dinner. You have to have something different for dinner, and it has to be different not only in say what is the main course, but whether it's boiled or broiled or or roasted or whatever. And it might be so diversified that you go to a Chinese restaurant <laughs> for dinner. <laughs> It's also the place where you have honored guests. And in honored guests, you serve honorable foods. You don't serve hamburgers, you serve filet mignon, which is an honored guest in an American cuisine. It comes from France. <laughs> and you serve it to an honored guest. So, uh, so there is already a set of values that, which we would use to, the, to explain people's utilities involved in their shopping habits. Uh, and those values underlie the shopping habits. They're known, as I say, in profile. Uh, we don't know that there's a whole system of meats, for example, that uh, you could analyze uh, a, a system of, you can take the cow apart. Uh, there's, uh, steak is more honorable part of the cow than tongue, and it costs more, even though there's a lot more steak in the cow than there is tongue. Uh, and uh, internal organs, at least in American society, not so much in Britain, are uh, de classe food. You don't have kidneys and things in America. Uh, so, you, it's because they're more like the things that we call by the same name as human organisms. Human organs are cannibalistic foods to us, so they're low-class foods. Uh, so uh, there's a whole system there, as what I'm saying, that's that's subjacent to uh, and determining of uh, the way that, that people develop utilities. So that when you get a supply curve and a demand curve. I mean, it is a supply curve. I mean, it's not just one person. It's a whole, it's a representation of what is the man in the society at this, or what, or what is uh, produced in the society at this time, or what is the man in the society at this time. And as I point out in the paper, one of the, you know, this is just the sleight of hand that economists do. They give you a supply demand structure, curve, and then they give you another one, slightly, somewhat different. They say, see, we explain the difference between A and B. But how did you get from A and B? That's not in the notion of 
uh, the market itself. It's something that has to do with so-called exogenous factors like the labor market or the Egyptian uprising or something like that, which are so-called exogenous factors that are in fact fundamentally determining uh, the nature of the economy. So my argument is that it is a cultural order that's being represented in a market system. And, and that's why I say it's, it's why I argue that, that Polanyi's notion of being embedded which was also, there's a quote from Kenneth Golding in here, very similar, of being, of, of being in a context of the culture. It's not that it's in the context of the culture. It is, the, it is a, a, an objectification of the culture. It is the culture realized in material things. And what's more, that being the case, I must say that the infrastructure is itself a superstructure. Because the infrastructure has to be a representation of the total cosmic uh, sets of relationships that come down into particular good. What makes a woman's dress uh, button from one side and a man's from the other? I mean, there's a whole right-left situation there, and a whole right-left and right and left, we know, mean certain things in society, dexterous and sinister, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So uh, these material things are not simply a function of utilities. Far from it, not a material utilities. They are a function of the whole set of, uh, of political, social, ideological, etc. Uh, conditions uh, as they come down on uh, the constitution of objects and their value of objects. And, uh, and uh, you know, I had this, I had this uh, long problem, I had this discussion with Levi Strauss actually. <laughs> uh, I was in his, uh, I was in his seminar in the, in the 68, 69, I was at the Laboratoire of Levi Strauss and I gave a paper on economics uh, uh, it was about exchange systems in Melanie, uh, certain exchange systems in the UN Gulf of, Mel of New Guinea and uh, in uh, Central Australia. And, uh, and I started off by saying, you know, I'm not a structuralist and I'm going to talk about the real infrastructure, you know, what's really going on in the society, not this stuff about the exchange of symbols or women or ideas. This is about the real stuff. And he said, so I gave the paper, and Levi Strauss was the kind of person, uh, the kind of sem seminar uh, empresario who, if he liked you, he would say something nice about the paper. If he didn't like you, you would really get it. But he liked me because basically I was the court jester, since. Uh, in his seminar, the French are, were terrified of speaking. Uh, they had learned this uh, from grade one. You know, you don't don't say don't say anything out loud. You might uh, it, it might attract ridicule. So, so they so I was the only one who talked. <laughs> and not only did I talk, but I sometimes sort of, you know, not quite insulted him, but made fun. So he, so he liked me and he said, but you are a structuralist, which was the highest form of <laughs> <laughs> compliment that he could give me. I once had a greater compliment from Francois Furet, who said at one point when I was introducing me in a lecture with, vous êtes le plus français des ethnologues américains. <laughs> but he, he, uh, he said, well, you are a structuralist. So I said, no, I'm not. And I said, you know, and I quoted him from the Pensée Sauvage. I said, look, you say in the Pensée Sauvage, structuralism is a science of the superstructures. Basically a psychology, he said, at one point, is a science of the superstructures. And it's clear that I was talking about real economic utilitarian stuff. And he said, well, that's true, he said. But, uh, he said, I think uh, the point is that I learned my anthropology at the feet of Lowy and Boas and those people who were doing reservation Indians ethnography. They were working with Indians and trying to dredge back the memory of Indians 
from the 1930s to the 1870s. And, and he said and it was essentially the archaeology of the living. Meanwhile, what was going on around them was that they were, you know, getting impoverished, getting drunk, or these terrible things were happening in reservation, but nobody was paying attention to their real conditions of existence in the anthropology. But now he says, we have to extend structuralism to the infrastructure. I said, well, <laughs> as far as I understood it, it was a matter of, uh, it was a matter of principle that it was the science of the superstructures. So I have to ask you, what is structuralism? So he said, well, he said, enfin, it's good anthropology. <laughs> <laughs> which, in which sense I agreed that I was a structuralist. <laughs> <laughs> I don't, can I ask? Um uh, because of this dodge, uh, this tautological dodge of uh, well, uh, either they either they say, well, people value other things beside material satisfactions, and that's why they do something else. In other words, the reason for their preferences is taken as the explanation of their preferences, uh, and that explanation is non-economic uh, and non-material, I should say, and and. Uh, so in that sense, they're never wrong. Uh, uh, you know, if somebody gives, uh, uh, if if you, uh, if, you know, there's all this, uh, there's this riff about kinship in here, I mean, where which I didn't go into, but which is a fundamentally opposed to the notion of self-interest, since kinship, in fact, is a shared existence, shared being. Uh, by my definition, uh, and uh, and I pointed out you know, that that wonderful time I used to have during the McCarthy era when I would when I uh, would use uh, Lewis Henry Morgan's description of Montezuma's dinner as communism and living. He called it it's communism and living from each according to his ability to <laughs> to each according to her need. And that is the way that families operate. And if you're afraid of communism, you shouldn't go home. You know? <laughs> <laughs> and, 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 you know, in, in, uh, you don't, in, in a family, you don't uh, uh, carve the, the father doesn't carve the meat and say, how much am I getting for this piece, you know, <laughs> around the table to his children or his so there's no, there's, this transaction doesn't involve uh, reciprocity of, um, or payment. Uh, not even in the long run, basically, even though some economists try to you know, wiggle out of it. But when they get older, then the kids will do their own good. Uh, well, <laughs> lots of luck. I mean. But uh, <laughs> LOL, right? <laughs> In evolutionary terms, it means rewarding. Yeah. There's, a, there's some kind of rewarding in evolutionary terms. Yeah, well, <laughs> the point is that, that they can then say, you know, these people value their solidarity or their cooperation or their love or whatever, and that way it's always rational. But of course, uh, what's rational in one society in one case is not another, because uh, when they carve meat at, at uh, some restaurant, they have to pay for it, uh, in which case uh, uh, the same event produces a different outcome and they're both rational. So rationality is constant, uh, but what isn't constant is uh, the way that the society is organized or the relations are organized that are involved in the um, in the dis in the in the production and distribution of the material thing, uh, so economists can never be wrong if they say, well, they value childhood or they value familial relations. Or they, you see this kind of tautology, which is in fact the presupposition of what's going on, rather than the explanation. Uh, and uh, in that sense, they're never wrong. On the other hand. They, of course, are always wrong <laughs> uh, because 
they've left out of the equation of their science. I mean, they made a science in which the things that are, in fact, constituting the material life of society are by definition excluded. They're exogenous, like the, the Arab Spring, or they're exogenous factors. Uh, they're non-economic. Uh, they're even irrational. Uh, and in that sense, they're doomed. I mean, you're doomed because uh, by uh, an a priori decision, uh, you come to, you, you, you're, you're finished. The alternative is like my colleague Gary Becker of sainted memory. Well, he's still alive, actually. <laughs> uh, the, the Nobel Prize winning Gary Becker, you know, how did we get to monogamy? People used to like uh, uh, used, to, used to like polygyny and now they like monogamy. You know. Not people, but men, anyhow. You know. Men, uh, they decided they only wanted three children and they could get that with one woman. <laughs> and that's how we got monogamy. And, you know, he's, he's, not, he's never, he's, it's a fairy story, he's totally wrong. Uh, and, <laughs> and, um, and, and, and I think that that's the situation of Oh, economics, I and mean, why do they screw up so much otherwise? Uh, uh, everything's always a surprise. It's a surprise. <laughs> 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 you can't get oil through the Suez Canal, the price is going up. Surprise. <laughs> Before you pick up this point about uh, Polanyi and the economists, and you made the point about. Um, what you thought was his weakness when he talked about the disembedding of, of the market. Mm. Um, in the reading of, of The Great Transformation, which has actually become one of the most widely used textbooks on international development all over the world, it's really true, yeah. and it, quite, quite strikingly, in reaction to, precisely, um, neoliberal economics. I understand, yeah. One of the things that's striking about it for Polanyi in that book the so-called free market, the self-regulating market, is clearly a political ploy. It is a project of a bourgeoisie that in that context tries to pull away from all of the restraints in culture and society that decide the allocation and indeed the value of things. And in particular, what he focuses on was the movement backwards from product to factor to the factor markets, and what he focuses on, of course, is the labor market, and the attempt to make the market the essential allocator of labor um, within British society, uh, prompting, as he said, one, the destruction of social relationships, <coughs> in particular what Jim Scott would call the moral economy of a pre-capitalist uh, society, and then he insists that what it does is provoke what he calls the other part of the double movement, the self-protection of society to try to re-embed the market within, in a sense, the notions of allocation of value that are essentially political. And I think that it opens up a very interesting issue and I want to ask you about, and that is you're suggesting already um, a historical, political, cultural analysis of economics itself which I think is, is something that is of compelling contemporary importance for, for obvious reasons, because they're always wrong. But if you notice the way in which they react to that failure is, no, they're never wrong. The theory is never wrong. You did it wrong. That's right. Um, and that seemed to be, well, it's already been pointed out by Deirdre McCloskey, that that's the logic that Evans Pritchard um, described in Witchcraft <laughs> Oracles and Magic and the Azandi. That's yeah, why right. Witchcraft always wins, yeah, right. because you always do it wrong if it doesn't work. Right. No, you're right. I think what you're saying is uh, that it's, uh, you know, what we used to call, what we do call an ideology, of, uh, and, uh, which has a constituting force. Uh, in the uh, in the politics and uh, and the economics of the world, and is and I, and I believe that's that's true, and uh, it's another reason. I mean, I I brought up the question at the beginning: why why is it that this crazy thing keeps on going on? And I think that certainly must be one part of the answer. Uh, uh, but I, I but I do believe that I mean 
Polanyi can be improved on. Although he was a great man, and I must say for uh, somebody who was a graduate student at the time, he was very impressive. He had this long scarf, which he wore all summer long. <laughs> <laughs> And he, he was afraid of courant d'air. He had to close the windows all the time in the middle of summer. Uh, I have a very quick question. Um, now, if we are, as anthropologists or historians, are meant to take the values of any particular society seriously when thinking about that society, so if a society values family, kinship, whatever, then we take that as a category of our for our analysis or try to do something that is approximate to their own categories in order to, to conduct analysis. So if um, economics, neoliberal economics, is the projection of our value set, why shouldn't we use it um, to understand, if not the rest of the world, but our society? Well, I, I, we can't use it to uh, um, to understand our society for the reasons that we've been talking about, because it doesn't explain our society. It, is, it assumes at some point uh, something that is in fact explaining the society or organizing society. Uh, it presumes it to be a function of individuals, which it is not, uh, and uh, it has therefore no social sense of the constitution of this as an historical phenomenon. Uh, so uh, it, it, it doesn't work in our society uh, as witness, uh, as I said before, how much they're wrong and how much they don't explain and how much they're caught by surprise. Uh, uh, it's, uh, it, 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 it's, uh, it's this radical, this is a radical um, decision to divide the world into so-called so economic and non-economic factors. Uh, and, and, and it's not simply, as I say, that the, that the economy is embedded. The economy is itself an objectification of, uh, of, these, fa of these things. It is the objective form of our relationships. Uh, and, uh, Therefore, we have to we have to know these relationships to know it, and they made a radical decision to exclude that, and so it doesn't work in our society or anywhere else. I mean, the, the whole notion of the free market is itself ridiculous. Uh, all the protection that has to be gone to create the free market is is unbelievably. And, and the, the incarceration <laughs> that has to go on to protect the free market. Somebody said it's, uh, it's the same as if the feudal knight of, in full armor mounted on his horse all by himself. No, it's not, not, it, it, it's, it's a canard. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I really like your, your, the points you make about totemism, but I wonder if I could play Levi Strauss's Devil, Devil's Advocate by uh, looking at so totemic societies as that constitute with, with an internally constituted speciation, but that are dependent on external relationships of uh, slavery, practical slavery, with uh, people who are excluded from entering the totemic system, uh, such as in Amazonia, you have the totemic societies, many of the totemic groups uh, rely on, on, on nomadic, uh, less developed people who do the hunting for them or or, or uh, marginal to them, and, and create both value uh, and and in goods and in um, in in uh, ritual terms as well. So what what's the question? So uh, how does this double relationship work? So that you have the internal. Did you say Amazonian society? Yes. Well, I mean, I mean they're fundamentally re dependent on external uh, on external. Uh, 
uh, often predation for their reproduction uh, in, uh, in, um, uh, in getting the, not only wives from predation but the names of their children and their own names and then there's I mean I quoted I mean, uh, this <laughs> about the dogs. Uh, was that in the difference paper? No, it was in the, in the this paper. Well, I, have, I can't find it, but the point is, uh, the Descola uh, uh, points out that, and uh, there's also the the Barsana that uh, Hugh Jones described, that's also discussed here, all these people who, uh, Hugh Jones doesn't know whether the differentiation of labor among these people that he's working with and these different uh, societies, he says, is it, is it, uh, totemism or not, you know? <laughs> but the point is that it's it is as radical as totemism. Uh, there are fundamental dependencies on outside, and uh, and they define they, all the Amazonian peoples define themselves by opposition to the outside. So, uh, th I don't think there's any case, or you could say otherwise. Uh. Can I actually follow up on what Anastasia asked? Um, it seems that you are offering an analysis of, let's say, the cosmology of Western bourgeois society, but you're doing it in your Stranger Kings paper, not in your value paper. Because if, if, if the ideology of Western society is based on the idea that the members of that society are uh, economic agents, then the, the, the people playing the, the, the others, the stranger kings, are, are, are uh, those responsible for the political dimension of society. And the diarchy is the diarchy between the economists, being the priests, being responsible for all the material processes, uh, telling people what, uh, what to do and what their relationship is, the relationship of affinity with the politicians. So, um, I'm tongue in cheek, of course. But um, when um, the money that enlivens relationships is the money that passes between co corporations and politicians. Uh, so there is actually a diarchy going on in the basis of um, Western, Western society. But, uh, but the stranger kings are, are political, are the politicians. And what they are is they're uh, strange or strangers or foreigners to the economy or the economic relations, which is taken by the priests, therefore the economists, as um, the, the, what, the combination of all economic subjects. I don't know if I followed the metaphor, but, uh, but uh, it seems to me that the notion that the politicians are the sleeping partners and the bourgeoisie would undermine it. Mm -hmm. right, yeah. A final relation. <laughs> uh, yeah, right. They don't marry them, no. Yeah. <laughs> They're in bed with them. Yeah. <laughs> It's a not strange bedfellows either. <laughs> Thank you. This is, this is an argument, not a question, but it's very brief. Uh, I think you may be a bit too cheery about the, uh, the, the failure of economics. Uh, it might be true that the, uh, and that's quite convincing, it is true, that ec economists don't understand economists because they're not thinking about them as the right sorts of things so they're fundamentally sort of ontologically uh, off beam that's a powerful and sufficient condition for them not understanding what's happening in economists but it might not be the only reason why they don't understand what's happening in economists because it might be the case actually that it's not within human cognitive powers to understand what's happening in economists in the right way and I think the, that what might be too cheerful is that it sounds a little bit when you talk about it as though there's no reason why anthropologists shouldn't understand what's happening in economists but of course if humans can't understand what's happening in economists anthropologists don't have such a good chance <laughs> uh, well, at least relatively, I think we're better off. <laughs> <laughs>
For some purposes, it's not rubbed. I mean, you know, I mean, at least I can talk about dress and food and uh, so forth. They, they don't even get that far, so. Um, Marshall, uh, you acted as a court jester in the court of Levi Strauss, so in your majestic presence, can I act as a court jester and follow up? Um, if some Martian anthropologist came down and looked at your position and Polanyi's position, they might well say, well, Polanyi didn't get very far because his main expertise was either in market economies or in uh, the trade and empire kind of economies. He ne never really understood or had a deep knowledge of tribal e economics. And that's your great strength. In tribal systems, as you've des described, uh, none of the spheres is either embedded or uh, divided. Everything is multi-level and everything contains all the different elements of our world. So unless you understand that properly, it's very difficult to make a critique of our society or to get much further. And, and Polanyi didn't understand that. And I'm grateful to you because I hadn't really seen the force of the metaphor of embeddedness. It means that there is a substance there like coal or whatever which is in the ground, but it is separate. And that is a mistake because in the tribal worlds there is no embeddedness in that yeah. sense. Um, but whereas you can make a critique from a tribal perspective, um, I'm searching for how you can go beyond what economists do. What seems to have happened is that the tribal world divided itself off into the long phase of, of peasant societies where politics and religion was separated off from economy and society. And then modern modernity, as we call it, is these four spheres have been artificially separated entirely so that you have an as-if world. It isn't real, but we have to pretend. And our whole civilization depends on a pretense, which is that economy, law, politics, religion, and society are separate. If we stop that pretense, then our legal system collapses, our law collapses, our economy collapses, and our politics collapse. Democracy is based on a pretense of that we are all seeking power and individual uh, rights and so on. Law is based on the pretense of the rational um, uh, actor and the, the reasonable man and so on. Economics and so on. Now, it may not work at all well, but it works not too badly. What I don't understand is what you would replace it with. It's well, yeah. Uh, first of all, I don't think it actually is as you describe. I think that's uh, largely an illusion. Uh, for example, if you think law is separated from economics, go to the University of Chicago Law School, where it's just uh, notable law and economics uh, theory. Uh, as for democracy, these uh, evolving uh, these separations, uh, one of the things about, I mean, democracy, it seems to me, is, uh, is in many ways a huge illusion uh, because there's hardly any institution in which you live which is democratic, the, including the, this structure that we're in. <laughs> uh, but certainly, no, no, this certainly, is this is almost democratic, but certainly uh, King's College is not mm -hmm. democratic. Uh, the, uh, the, the workplace is not democratically organized. Families are not democratically organized. Uh, uh, labor unions are not democratic. There's nothing but the political system as a whole, which in fact has degenerated into uh, um, highly plutocratic form, at least in the United States. So, uh, I mean, what do we mean by the fact that we live in a democracy? Uh, the emperor has no clothes, it seems to me. 
we, we live in families, we live in schools, we live in corporations, we live in offices, we live in all these places, none of which is democratically organized. So there is a, we ha you know, it's true, we, we think that there's a separate economy, we think there's a separate politics, but in fact, uh, in fact already it's obviously not the case. So. Uh, uh, and beside that, uh, although we think the world is organized by the maximization of our uh, scarce resources, uh, we live in we the, our most intimate relations and the most fundamental to our existence, namely the familial relations, are not organized that way at all. Uh, they are represented. In the it's amazing that the. Uh, notions of human nature that we have are based upon what is not universal, namely the bourgeois, bourgeois men. Uh, but uh, what is universal, namely a kinship order, is not considered to be a representation of human nature. But in fact, a kinship order, uh, children have more, relate, even pre-linguistic children, as I try to show in my kinship book, which I recently published and I recommend to you. <laughs> uh, even pre-linguistic children have uh, fundamental relations of uh, mutuality or weeness, not the question of reciprocity, altruism or anything, but the notions of transcending the opposition of self and other. It's, it's possible in pre-linguistic children. So even in pre-linguistic children we have a situation of uh, the transcending of the self, which is inimical and opposite of our notions of economics. So what I'm what I'm saying is this is an unrealistic organization of the world. Yes, it's very deeply entrenched and it's uh, very heavily funded and it's very heavily supported in political ways and other ways. Uh, but I think it's up to us as scholars uh, to point out uh, what is what is possible and real about these things and hopefully that it will affect the, in the long run some changes uh, and I don't think it works very well it doesn't work very well I'm going to press my last question so if you know kingship is an idea Clan is an idea, family is an idea, economy is an idea, market is an idea, individual is an idea, democracy is an idea. Why do we, why should we assume that democracy is much more of an illusional object, mental object, than family or kingship? I didn't say family is simply or an idea or anything is like, you know, if they're all ideas, it doesn't, nothing is more real than anything else. By uh, by defi by your definition, but I never said that. Uh, and and uh, and 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 uh, what is what is uh, obvious to me is that we we live each other's lives in families. We die each other's deaths. We share our pains. We share our joys. Uh, we have other selves of ourselves in families. This is a real fact about uh, kinship, at least as most of us know it for most of our kin. There's some, there's some of us, <laughs> not the case. Uh, and that is a different kind of relationship than is involved in the supposition of the market economy. And yet it's the one that is universal. It's the one we all participate in. It's the one we totally ignore when we talk about human nature. As it turns out, if you follow the, the, uh, this work of Thomas Sello and his associates, these people who are working on, uh, on the question of intentionality and sociability of, of um, neonatal onto uh, early years of linguistic capacity children, turns out that they have done all kinds of experiments comparing them to primates. And in things like the ultimate game, which is an experiment where 
uh, you know, two people are given, a, a person is given a sum of money, say $100, and he, ha and he, ha he makes an offer to the other person of a certain percentage of it. The other person, if he refuses that offer, nobody gets anything, and if he takes it, he gets something. So it turns out that people will not take a 20% share. Even though they would rather cut off their nose and spite the other guy than to take a 20% because it's not fair. But apes do. <laughs> uh, and uh, the, the very s clever experiments showing that, that uh, chimpanzees have uh, uh, worked totally on self-interest without any question of social relations to the others. So what this <laughs> proves is that only apes have human nature. And and I was wondering whether I'd be allowed to ask a slightly broader question. We've been talking about the you know, discipline of economics quite a bit today, but I was really curious to hear your thoughts perhaps on the way in which you think the discipline of anthropology has changed since the time of Levi-Strauss, some of the things that you've seen that you think have worked really well. And I'm also very curious to hear your thoughts on the future of anthropological knowledge and thinking uh, in the next few decades, where you see the discipline going. I know it's a rather broad question, but I don't get a chance to ask you the, this question often. So. <laughs> I once heard Rodney Beatum bad mouth, and in his older years, bad mouthing anthropology, and I would said, "I'll never talk about anthropology when I get older, <laughs> because it's bound to be bitter." <laughs> uh, uh, I um, I don't know about. Uh, what, the, what has happened since Levi-Strauss? One, one of the things about uh, structuralism that strikes me is that uh, it, in fact, declined almost immediately that it was announced in the Anglo-Saxon world. Um, despite uh, arguments like this guy Mirowski from Notre Dame, for example, who said that structuralism was basically a social science version of information technology, of the, the, the development of computers and so on. Uh, uh, it, there's been an inverse relation between the popularity of structuralism and the development of IT. <laughs> um, and uh, and um, in America, it's uh, it's the S word. It's a bad word. If you don't, if you want to eliminate somebody from getting a job at the University of Chicago, just call them a structuralist, and they don't get a job. I'm not kidding. You. I mean, I I could mention some extremely illustrious names uh, and great anthropologists who have been called structuralists in the Department of Anthropology and were rejected from positions at Chicago. So the question, uh, wh wh how did that happen is an interesting question. Uh, well, one thing that's very clear is that, in fact, people have depended largely on Levi-Strauss, but it's like Skip Rappaport once told me, he says, they're, they're standing on his shoulders and pissing on his head. <laughs> 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 uh, and uh, the, the several, the several reasons that I think are important. Uh, one of them would be, as far as Levi-Strauss is concerned, the decline of interest in American, uh, Native Americans, because that's his major ethnographic field and where he, you know, where the whole mythologique and everything was written about. And it's a non-field in America since World War II, even though it's hugely rich ethnography. Uh, 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 another thing has been, well, to get to cut to the quick, I think the most important thing is that right, left, and center, we live in an anti-structuralist age, anti-structural age, academic politics, or political academics, whatever you want to call it. On the right, you have neoliberalism, which is, of course, hostile to any kind of collectivism. 
uh, 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 any sense of a larger order. Call postmodernism the center. Uh, it is uh, against totalized narratives, uh, essentialism, any kind of larger system. Uh, it's wallow, it loves to wallow in uncertainties about these things. Uh, and then on the left, unfortunately and correctly, the structures are the enemies to gender equality, uh, uh, um, uh, uh, gay rights, uh, race, racial rights, uh, third world uh, liberation, etc. The structures have been the enemy. So, wherever you look, structures are uh, devalued in the, in our world. Um, the only one that's left is this sort of notion of global domination, uh, 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 but but it doesn't. Uh, the same people who talk about it deny any sort of structuralism. So I think that's for the moment out. Whether it comes back again, I don't know. Uh, basically, uh, uh, Descola has a book out uh, which has just been translated by Janet Lloyd, actually. Uh, a brilliant translation. Uh, in which uh, there is a revival of a comparative sense. It's, it has a kind of Mary Douglas quality of a fourfold field, but, you know, like grid and group, but, it, but at least it has a huge ethnographic interest and comparative interest. Uh, one of the, one of the uh, categories in his fourfold field is what he calls analogic ontologies. And that's an ontology like, it, it, actually the Foucauldian notion of uh, uh, Renaissance, late middle age ideologies of the plenitude of the world. There are, there's, everything, there's everything in the world that, and, and everything is only marginally different from everything else. And the only way that you, I mean there's one way that you can organize this is by some sort of overwhelming uh, ideal uh, structure like the like um, the tree of life or something like uh, uh, am I trying to think of the stages of chain of being yeah. uh, and another way is by analogies uh, to uh, for example uh, to use a Foucauldian example um, migraines are, are, you can cure migraines with walnuts uh, because uh, God left a signature in the identity of their appearance. Uh, <laughs> so these things go together. And what we have in anthropology is a bunch of discussions of trivialities which are often uh, either related to each other and I and I wrote a preface to Descola's book and I talked about all these wonderful studies like the reception of Zizek on the northwest side of Chicago. That's, a, that's an article in a prominent anthropology journal. Uh, <coughs> or uh, uh, the, no, the notion of anxiety in Greek psychiatry. Or middle class Israeli women's relation to hummus. <laughs> uh, so you can, uh, and the other alternative is that the chain of being one is uh, Homus and capitalism, <laughs> Zizek and capitalism. Uh, and where anthropology seems to me is now, uh, or neoliberalism, anyway, is it's in danger of becoming an exotic branch of economics, that we study uh, these exotic economies, how they're becoming capitalized. Uh, and um, that's one danger. And the other is, uh, another is the lack of, it seems to me a lack of real curiosity in, in the world of difference and cultural difference. Mm. Uh, certainly, which goes with a lack of historical sense about the field, and 
and an argument about what's happening to us is really important and let's study that which is interesting because if everybody does that 25 years from now nobody will pay any attention to what you're doing now <laughs> so uh, it's a kind of disarray I guess so, so unlike my vow not to talk like Rodney Dita I do <laughs> <laughs> Professor Silence, I'd like to ask a question. Um, it refers more to your uh, difference and value papers, but there's also something about your paper of yesterday. And it's about Romani communities. About what? Romani communities. Oh. Um, I um, noted somehow, uh, with some surprise, that although you give examples from all over the world, and although uh, this uh, unwillingness or, or inability to accept difference in, in Western Europe and North America is one of the, the, the things that you are analyzing. Mm -hmm. um, these communities, which um, have a lot of the characteristics that you mentioned, uh, there wasn't one single example. Um, and there was, well, maybe, I mean, there are very many, and there may, may be many others of which there, there are no examples, but they just happen to be right here in Cambridge or in, in all over the USA. <laughs> uh, but, for example, what the question that was asked about the exchange and that you said that exchange doesn't always mean a, a, um, appropriation. In the case of the, the bride gold um, the, um, for, for Romani uh, um, marriages in most communities, it is um, the gold is actually worn by the bride throughout her life. And it is the ultimate insurance. That's the very last thing you sell when you really are totally desperate. And that is how this object uh, uh, functions in that society. Mm -hmm. So that, that is one, um, one, it would be one example of what you said. And for, uh, for the um, uh, Stranger Kings paper, it's curious that although this society has no kingship, it has only loose leadership. Uh, which goes from individual to individual as they are performing the, the, the duties of, of a leader uh, and as they are uh, uh, seen to fit the image of a leader. Uh, and it can be a collective thing. Uh, there are in uh, um, uh, Roman storytelling a lot of stranger king stories. And there is even one, at least one I know of, where um, the stranger king is presented as uh, a, a Roman person who comes to take over an imaginary kingdom uh, from those who, ha who had excluded him from, 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 from this imaginary kingdom. So that, that's what I wanted to say. Thank you. Well, thank you. Yeah, the last is uh, certainly very much like uh, the examples I gave yesterday. Uh, it's true. I mean, uh, it's true. I don't deal with the Romani communities. I don't deal with, uh, you know, there are thousands of others, but I never studied them. I, n I never worked on them, so I couldn't say. In fact, the only ethnography, uh, there's Joseph Mitchell's stories in, the, in this great book called Up in the Old uh, Hotel, but uh, about Romani communities in New York, in uh, America, but Basically, I don't know anything about it. Just, um, this is really a comment on yesterday's paper. Um, the indigenous population is much more likely to have absorbed the incoming stranger who originated the Mampusi kingship than anything else. <coughs> However, I think it's, it's, it's important not only for an understanding of the politics, but also perhaps for the mar notion of the market, that territory in this uh, polity <coughs> is not the kind of commodity that it is in, in many other uh, communities and states, mm. and, and certainly for us. Mm. It is not bounded. It is not, um, what's the word? It's not simply that, that chiefs and kings need people. 
uh, rather than land. It's that land, there's a moral aspect to the use of land that's quite significant. I, I, I got the feeling myself that if someone arrived and needed to farm, uh, you had to find land for that person because it would be like our refusing air to breathe. I mean, this is, this is something which it was not morally possible to, um, to exclude the use of land for, uh, for other human beings and if you, you know, providing you weren't, didn't want to really get rid of them. <coughs> so I think there's certain contexts, perhaps both in the politics of states and in the politics of economics, uh, in which you, th there are larger issues which differentiate um, whole societies. And you can't simply uh, ignore them in view of a general. Are you Susan? Yeah. <laughs> what? That does. Oh my goodness. Um, <laughs> um, yeah, I. Uh, I mean, I. I think that one of the interesting things about Stranger King systems is the variety of economic systems and even in propriety systems in which it is found. And I, I, I don't know if I had it in this chapter, but I, I do have it somewhere in this book to be. The, the, you can find it in slave, enslaving societies. You can find it in uh, you know, West African uh, 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 trading societies of the coast. You can find it in the in the jungle, you can find it in East <coughs> African cattle societies. I mean, you can find it in a huge variety of, of systems. The same in Southeast Asia. I mean, you find can find it in irrigate uh, where, where there's still large scale irrigation, where there's slash and burn agriculture. Even London. <laughs> 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 yeah, right. So, uh, I'm I'm more impressed with the similarities, but you have a point. I mean, there are differences. Mm. Uh, but I, I, I sort of working on this ideal typical type, as I said, and I'm impressed with the variety of infrastructures that it can accommodate, no. uh, including my person. <laughs> <laughs> Um, I think we've got time for one more question, and then we should probably wrap up. Uh, I've got one more question. <laughs> Given that you've had three, yeah. <laughs> actually, it would be fitting in the last one of the term. It's okay. <laughs> well, Marshall, I'm wondering now um, how we can actually seriously reckon with societies that are based on difference rather than on sameness, um, that structure their cohesion or relations mm. through difference, if we continue to talk in terms of groups, societies or communities, which really are sorts of terms that are very much our terms, which refer to a kind of bounded homogeneity, I suppose, socially, even culture, I mean, that's, it assumes sameness of some sort, of some mm. fundamental sort. What do we do? What do we do? How do we how do we organize societies on different? No, how do we organize our thinking in order to really seriously deal with societies that are based on difference fundamentally rather than on safety? Well, I, you know, it's not a. I don't think it's a question of sitting down and saying we're going to decide to organize our world on difference. I think it's a political process. I mean, if you look at the uh, uh, sexual relations, gender relations, uh, etc. The changes that have come about in so radically, so quickly, uh, that wasn't simply a question. And there's a, now an acceptance of difference uh, that didn't exact, exact, exist before. As long as it's the same as us. What? As long as it's the same as us. Well, I mean, it's pretty, it's pretty cynical to suppose that same-sex marriage is the same as heterosexual marriage. Uh, it has its resemblances. <laughs> uh, but uh, I, I think that the, you know, the, 
when we get in a political process like that, it's, that's where it happens. When people who are, say, handicapped, organize and, uh, and demand to have uh, certain rights uh, with regard to their uh, mobility on the public way, then we get, a, then we get differences being written. <coughs> so I think that's a political process which incidentally is becoming increasingly possible because there everybody I mean, fat people have rights, and thin people have rights, <laughs> everybody has rights. Uh, so it's becoming more and more a possibility. Well, on that note, I think let us exercise our right to um, alcohol. Um, and before we do that, um, to thank Marshall very much, not only for today, but also for yesterday. Yeah.